gang. Yay. Uh, five on the floor. Ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing. You can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck said, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor playing. Got an all band. Y'all seen the block. Stop the one hand. And Pat, we trust. It's power, have the guts. We here to bring the heat. Y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. Well, that was more bad basketball than we should have had to watch. Uh, the Miami Heat beat the Atlanta Hawks tonight, 117 to 111 in Atlanta. We will get to all the details of it as we go forward here live on the youtube channel of course these posts to the podcast feed afterwards make sure you subscribe to both so you get all of our content on the youtube channel you get content on the other sports as well i'm ethan skull you can follow me ethan j skull on five reasons sports i got alex toledo you can follow me tropical blanket i got brady hawk you can follow me brady hawk 305 greg will be back tomorrow night and thanks to the more than 100 of you who joined us on playback tonight we had a good crowd on playback and that made this somewhat tolerable um Playback.tv slash Bob Arson. There you go. I'll I'll start I'll start here. Although Alex just did. Uh, I I'll I'll start here. Okay. Pretty much everybody on the Heat contributed to this game having to go to double overtime because you could find mistakes with all of them, but enough of them contributed to pull out the victory finally in the second overtime. And we'll get into who did. And who didn't? But the overall ramifications are, of this are: uh, Heatles here in the chat says, "My eyes hurt, and not from the eclipse, but that heat game. My God, you should have taken those glasses uh, from the night before and used them to watch this game uh, in Atlanta." But the the overall, the big picture here is that the seven and six seeds are now still in play. Uh, the six seed, not so much because Indiana won tonight. Uh, but Philadelphia, Embiid got hurt, came back into the game, but you're still in striking distance of Philadelphia, and we're still pointing to that game between the Sixers and Orlando as a game where maybe they trip up. But, of course, the other issue for the Heat now is after they had, what is it, four guys play at least 40 minutes tonight. Uh, Bam played 48. Tyler, in his third game back, played 48. Butler played 44, and Jovic played 40. After that, they got to come home and play Dallas, which is a hot team that is playing for a playoff spot right now uh, or for playoff positioning in the Western Conference. And they got to deal with Kyrie and Luka uh, tomorrow night. So it, not the best circumstances, but at least you keep Philadelphia in striking distance to potentially get that seven spot and at least get a home play in game. Before we get to the Rocky sports game of the night, uh, I'll go to you first on this, Brady. I mean, what is your takeaway? From, like, the offensive structure late. Like, wh- what are they doing? Because, I, I, cause I, I mean, we're going to pick a play of the night, and, I mean, there's some good. I mean, I, I think we may end up going with one of Tyler's or maybe one of Jovic's. But, like, what is that at the end of regulation? Like, what are they trying to accomplish? Why are Jovic, Hero, and I guess it was... I was at Bam, I guess, on the on the upper right side, on the right mm-hmm. corner, and Jovic doesn't seem to know where to go, and it's like it's like they were moving around like in a conga line, like trying to figure out who was supposed to be in what spot, and and it's Jimmy Iso again, yep. like just yep. frankly, what is that crap? I mean, this is a team that should not be going ISO mode. Like they're the most opposite built of ISO mode that you could possibly make. That they need to play a similar structure. Now, if you're going to go ISO mode, you cannot go with six to seven seconds left on the clock. Like, if you're going to go ISO mode, you better go. I'm not even thinking. Usually teams say eight. I'm thinking 12, 13 with this team. Like, you need to go early because most of the times they're going to cut it off and it's going to end up with Jimmy on the right wing and he's going to be stuck in no man's land. The one pass away is going to be cut off and all of a sudden he's going to turn and it's going to be reverse mode. And all of a sudden there's two seconds on the clock and you're looking around. It's like. You have to start earlier. You have to put the ball in different positions. Like, I'm going to be honest, because I know we're going to talk about, a lot about, about Tyler and Nico. I thought there was positions in those specific spots where they needed – it was tie game and they have one possession to try to score. Where I'm like, put the ball in Nico's hands and let Jimmy be the roller. Just let him make the decision. Let him get the ball in Jimmy's spot instead of Jimmy having to try to get to his spot because we know the spot that Jimmy's going to get to. They need somebody to put him in that position on nights like this. So, 
that's the, I think the adjustment. It's like, okay, it's not okay, Tyler Jimmy, Tyler Jimmy. I don't think that's the play here. And honestly, Terry, I think, is the guy that's gonna be taking a lot of these shots, especially in games right. like this one. Terry would have taken it probably at least two of them because he can create a good look. He's a guy that can get a shot off no matter what. So it's a different different standard. But here's the thing, I think the difference with Tyler to Jimmy in that scenario is like Jimmy's not going left with in that no. position. He does not go left. Never. They're going to screen Never. right, and he's going to flow into his right way, and he's going to see if he can get into a jumper. If not, it's a pass. So it's like it's kind of scripted against at this point. So that's why I'm like, this is always going to be the case. I mean, we're we're always going to have these discussions, but I think there is a point where you start running Bam or Jovic because Bam didn't really have it tonight. But there's going to be nights where you can run it into Bam and let him kind of dictate and, and maybe run an inverted stuff for with Jimmy. I don't know. I just I just think there's different alternatives. An ISO mode, but I think the thing that bothers most people is not only the ISO, but it's the fact that they do it so late and then their backs are against the clock. It's definitely a problem. You realize what you're saying, and you're right, by the way. Like, we're saying that the ball should have been in the 20 year old's hands. I mean, you're 20, so I guess that's why you're leaning that way. Uh, the ball should probably the show should be in the 20 year old's hands. Um, the ball should have been in the 20 year old's hands. At the end of the game, a guy who was being sent back and forth to Sioux Falls earlier in the season and being told to play the five. Like, this is this is where they're at. And you know why they're there? Because their three best players don't fit. They don't fit. And so, like, we talk about the actions that they're supposed to run at the end of games. Like, what are the actions that work? Between the three of them. And for a while, it was... And look, we're not going to blame Tyler for stuff tonight because I'm going to get to him in the next segment. But, like, what did, it was the Bam Tyler pick and roll, right? Like, that was it. Okay? And otherwise, it's what? The Bam Duncan DHO, which they can't go to right now, obviously, because Duncan's not there. And then it, it, with, with Jimmy, though, like... It, We've talked about it. There are no Jimmy Bam actions that they consistently go to. There are some that they could. They don't go to them. So it's like the three of them are out there, and nothing's being run. And, and, and I push we're back? talking about it. You know, I, I'd like you to push back because, again, this is this guy is – and I think he's the best coach in the NBA. Why does it look like this all the time? With this, is, if, if it's not the roster, it's him, right? It's one or the other. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I know everybody hates the cop out answer, but what I wanted to say was I'm not gonna defend what they were doing in, you know, in the crunch time tonight. Like they were it was a lot of squandered offensive possessions. And yes, like, you know, not having Terry and Duncan with the team as stars for offense as this heat team is, is a blow. But that doesn't excuse the way that it got so stagnant down the stretch. You know, and yes, like as it gets to a double overtime game, guys' legs are gonna be tired. They gotta play again tomorrow night possibly against both Luca and Kyrie. Who knows if they rest guys now that they've got this little cushion as the, the five seed, uh, the Mavericks do. But as far as the Heat's, like, crunch time offense goes, we've seen them go to, you know, the Jimmy Bam, clear out a side, pick and roll often, in the and even in the playoffs throughout the years. And then the other action that d doesn't always involve Tyler because Tyler has just not that been there that often in the playoffs. But, like, you know, the guard – screening for jimmy so that they can get the mismatch like i think if tyler has the smallest guy on the court on him that's something that you could see in the playoffs if they're playing together in crunch time but i but that again that's not what was happening down the stretch tonight it was just you know kind of jimmy and tyler taking turns running pick and roll and i thought the movement that you've seen um you saw kind of throughout the game at points even though i thought the heat's you know turnover situation was real bad tonight but in general like there was no ball movement down the stretch and i hate when they do that i just don't think they're capable of of getting good offense out of that over and over especially with the way that jimmy's like free throw stuff has kind of been up and down even though i will say you know got into back to double digit free throw attempts the past couple of games so that's good to see but like i think there is stuff there is upside between those three guys together if you wanted to run actions with them like you, you could potentially do some stuff where uh, you know, Tyler is screening on the backside. Maybe they do some sort of spade pick and roll with Tyler flaring out while Bam rolls. Like, there's stuff that they can do, but that's not what they were doing tonight. Like, they slowed down the pace and essentially said, Jimmy, Tyler, whoever's running the pick and roll in this possession, like, go make the play. And then Jovic came in and was just kind of filling in the holes or the, or the gaps on the offensive side, making plays as a connector he is. But um, I just don't think that is the best form of offense for them. But, you know... Spo is obviously a million times smarter than me, so I guess I'll defer to him. Then. 
No, but no, but that, but that's the thing, Alex. Like that's that's what I'm getting at here is that you know it, it, everybody you know look LeBron James now references Spo as a genius at you know transition offense, <laughs> and yet this team is horrific at transition offense. And so I, I keep coming back to this: it's one or the other. It's the coach or it's the roster, and we don't want to lean towards the coach because we're like we know how good this guy is. So that makes you look more at the roster. I mean, we'll get. Um, I want to get to the Rocky Sports Gamer of the Night here, and and there were a couple of choices. I think just two, honestly, maybe a third. Although I don't know what he was doing at the end of a couple of the uh, <laughs> at, at, at at the end of a regulation and an overtime. But let's get to the Rocky Sports Gamer of the Night. And now on Five on the Floor, it's time for the Gamer of the Night, sponsored by Rock Esports Center, the place to eat, drink, and play all day. Host your next birthday party with them. Located at 15305 South Dixie Highway in Palmetto Bay, they've got a 5,500-square-foot state-of-the-art center equipped with all the high-end power. Play all-day passes, available for just 25 bucks. but if you mention five reasons... It's just $20. So mention five reasons or five RSN. You get to play all day for $20. And now, the gamer of the night. All right, 48 minutes, 13 of 25 from the floor. Includes four of 13 from three. Nine of 12 from two. We'll get to the play of the night in a second because I think it's him also. Uh, Five rebounds, four assists, 33 points. And I thought he played good defense today, like legitimately good defense um, for most of the game. It's Tyler Hero, and it, it's Tyler Hero because, look, we talked all year, like, okay, is he a starter on this team? When he comes back, is he going to be a starter? And then Duncan's injury, um, now I don't know how long he's going to be out, but it doesn't look good, um, has created this void. And, look, Tyler stepped into it. Um, and And there were some bonehead decisions by him down the stretch. And I'm just at this point, uh, and I'll go to you first on this Brady. I'm just at this point where, you know, you just got to live with it, (laughs) right? Like, it's just like, because he can do things that others on this team cannot do. Um, And, but there's also going to be a couple of shots in there at the end of games that you're like, what is that? Um, Even though he's made some of those in the past, Uh, how would you evaluate his overall uh, game tonight? I mean, once it started kind of bogging down the offense, that it felt like that's when the inefficiency started kicking in a little bit. But even then, I mean, he carried them for most, you know, most of the night offensively. He was efficient from two. At, I think at one point he was six for six from two in that first half. And it was like, we kept talking about it. He was driving hard. He was taking contact. He was being physical. He was finishing with both hands. I think the left hand stuff, I keep bringing it up, but like he's using his left way more since returning. Uh, as a passer and as a scorer, like you're seeing him finishing at the rim with it, but he's also doing these these left-handed, you know, skip passes and everything along the lines that it's like, okay, this changes some things with him as a passer if he's able to kind of do this stuff on the move. Uh, then the stuff late, you see like <laughs> they're going to Jimmy, you're seeing what it's getting to, and then it got to the point, double OT, where they were like, all right, Jimmy, just go to dunker spot, go in the corner, let's see what Tyler Van Pick a roll can get us, and, and he started kind of getting them into a flow. He had the kind of rhythm where he got them – he finally drove left, and he got fouled on the pull-up. Then he got to the floater that put them up four. Uh, and then they were so worried about him on the third possession that he just swung it to Haywood, and Haywood just caught it and drove down baseline and got a quick bucket. And it was like, which, by the way, is what they should do. Like, it shouldn't have to be two seconds on the shot clock. Haywood's like, okay, I, there's 13 seconds on the shot clock. I can attack it this time. I, I'm not. A, I, it's not supposed to be under four. Um, but I thought his, his game was was what they needed. I thought he's he's, he's still a valve of offense – that can get to a mm. shot when needed. Like he can at least get them a shot off. Like he got the shot off the finish regulation, which was just hurt his efficiency because that shot was so unnecessary. The fact that Jimmy pitched it back to him, uh, 17 seconds left on an inbound and he's taking a logo three that he got forced into. But when he's creating offense, he can get to a good look. And most nights when Bam is in a flow, cause that was not really tonight, but he has that ability. Cause you can see, mm. He didn't really have the pocket pass too much tonight because they were covering uh-huh. it and Bam was not in the flow. So he's like, okay, I have to go to my other option and keep getting to that shot. So I thought his overall game was pretty good. Um, but I do think the bouncing back and forth thing is a problem, especially when Terry's back in the equation. And you have three guys that are bouncing back and forth and saying, okay, what whose turn is it at this time? So that that's when I think it is. But let me just say, because I know we're talking Tyler right now. We're going to get to this guy in a little bit. 
I don't know if I even would have went to him on, on game of the night. I, I know he was great, yeah. but I just want to say Nikola Jovic tonight, man. Yeah. Like he, he, that's a guy like, I just want to say has not closed many games. Like he, he's mm-hmm. a guy that plays the start of halves and he does not close many games They put this position. It's like, okay, let's see what he can do in this position. And to do that, to hit big shot after big shot, big passes, running the break, like not being afraid of the moment. Like, when you're talking about you know moments that you think back on, like I, I thought this was a pretty big one for Nicole Jovic, just because it's a different step and a different thing. And eight of twelve shooting, twenty three points, like just a great. Like th- they were not in that position without him. All right, so I, I'm gonna go to Jovic next, then. Okay, and and here's what I'll say about that. Um, I didn't go with him as game of the night again because the symbolism of of hero doing this by, by being put back in the starting lineup and again carrying during a lot of stretches of this game and making what was probably the biggest shot in this game uh, when he got to the floater. Um, but ultimately, what's happened the past two games, the most significant thing that is happening this season is Nikola Jovic's development. I'm ready to say that at this point because this team's not winning a championship. OK, and I don't know that they're getting out of the first round. Uh, we'll see who they play. But again, it depends even if they get out of the play in. OK, which we saw. I mean, look at that. I mean, if they get stuck with Atlanta in an eight, nine game, they might drop it. I mean, I know they do a really good job on Trey, but he's coming back soon. And that gives them another option in addition to Jante Murray. Um, so I, I don't know where this season is going, but it's probably not ending with a ring. I think what we're going to remember this season for is Jovic's step forward. I mean, you you are talking about a 20-year-old who, again, was going back and forth to Sioux Falls and being told to play a position he did not want to play, was being translated improperly by reporters about it. Okay, The question was whether or not he was going to go in the tank. All that kid has done is smile and work. That's all he's done. And he has endeared himself to the top end teammates on this team who have wanted him to play more. And now not only is he starting, you made the point, he's closing. And he is the guy who got the game back under control in Indiana. And he is the guy who I was like, put the ball in his hands. Okay. At the end of the game, not Jimmy's, not Bam's tonight for sure. All right. And Tyler, yes, you kind of live with it. But Jovic has made monumental improvement, and the ceiling is ridiculous with him. And I I don't think there's any question on whether he's a core piece going forward. And that, to me, is the single biggest development of this season in a positive way, is that they have another build-around player, um, and I don't see any way that he goes backwards. Curious, we're going to get to Butler and Bam's games here in a second, Uh, but Alex, your thoughts on Jovic tonight? Just awesome, man. He's been phenomenal, and the, it's been so encouraging to see a guy not just, you know, take a take a leap, but it's like he was not really playable last season, and then of course he went through the injury stuff. So just a really rough first season. Was really young, came in noticeably, you know, um, bigger physically, and then just what he's done with this game ever since then. Like he's ta- he's had different improvement. I mean, improvement on different areas throughout the season. And it's like you look at tonight, right? The 23 points is obviously great. The eight rebounds is great for a guy who isn't considered a strong rebounder. And yes, this game went to double overtime. It probably inflates some of these stat lines we're seeing tonight for sure. But Jovic, you know, going five of eight from three, that was something that was a question mark with him before, too. It was like, well, like in theory, he could shoot, but he wasn't so consistent. And this season, he's he's 100 percent rectified that. And I think answered that question we haven't we haven't like been concerned about Jovic's shot for a long time now and the way he functions as a connector with the team has never been in question and has only been you know I think emphasized after watching him um fill in with the starters here and look man that's that's a really valuable like skill set to have Mm -hmm. like you look at Mm -hmm. the best teams in the league they have role players who do a good job filling in the gaps with their starters mm-hmm. and like Iko Jovic is not going to be the guy that they go to for crunch time offense mm-hmm. the, uh, yeah, as far as like to just you know hold the ball like they do with Jimmy and Tyler at times unfortunately where he's just going to make the one be the one making the plays but look he's going to get the ball at some point you know down the stretch and he's going to make the right decision whether it's in the flow of the offense or you know just him attacking I think he could still improve the finishing but like he's fantastic there's no question about it and it feels like you know, him and Jaime have just kind of switched places. Yeah. 
right? Where yeah. like Jaime was the golden boy with the way Jaime had started. only had only two shot attempts again tonight. Uh, the I minutes, mean, I mean, you're drafted. talking. And, and, yeah, Jaime was playing like mid to high 30s and closing earlier in the season. And now he's getting 12 minutes and taking two shots. So it definitely has. I do think he hit the rookie wall a little bit. But I also think this is why we said Jaime was more ready to play right away. But Jovic has the higher ceiling. I, and I, I, I think you know that is true. Not, outside of, yeah, that is true. And, and you know what the difference is, I think, between them and the way that we've seen things kind of go and, you know, in, in reverse here as far as the way that it started is that Nico has solidified himself because he fits so much better with right. the starters and because he doesn't need stuff run for him, which was being said about Jaime to start the season. But now the thing with Jaime is when he's not getting stuff run for him, AKA those post touches, whether mid post or low post, mm -hmm. he's not really an offensive. Well, Jovic, but, but, but Alex, Jovic's game is more variable. I think, I think that's part of it. And, and I also think what you're talking about is important here. And Brady, hopefully will rejoin as he said, some camera, he's a better connector uh, and a better play the... finisher because Hawkins right. is not getting great looks. And he's like, he needs the game. I think he needs to play his game. Right, and it needs to be run for him, and I don't think that that fits into the way they're doing things now. They're just not running but, post touches for him. But, but but that's the other thing, though, is that the Jovic is making those open threes. Now Hawk has made one tonight. Okay, he did make one tonight um, from the corner, but the teams are giving both of them that shot. Jovic is making it, and that that's and and I think that's part of it. But I I think what's so impressive about Nico is, I think it's harder as a guy who. Uh, has been a featured player, okay, to play as a role player, okay. I, I mean, and and I, I think the fact that he's he's made that transition when they start to find sets to put the ball in his hands more consistently next year with certain lineups, uh, he's going to be really dynamic. And and I I, I do see and some some of our friends here in the chat are saying he should have played more last year. It was obvious. I, I can tell you from talking to people in the Heat front office. And I agree with them. Um, the, I, I think he's playing this way in part because they didn't rush it. I really do. I, I think that that the one thing I trust them with is development. Like, I, and, and I think that he needed to sit and watch a little bit to get to the point that he's at right now. All right, I don't want to waste all this Brady camera time here. Let's get to the uh, let's get to the play of the night. And now it's time for the Insurance by Lynette Play of the Night, sponsored by InsuranceByLynette.com and A Aggressive Insurance Agency. You can reach out to our friend Lynette at 954-581-8800. That's 954-581-8800 or InsuranceByLynette.com. That's InsuranceByLynette.com with two N's and two T's. Your best play for auto insurance, homeowner's insurance, condo insurance, life insurance, or a retirement program reach out to Lynette at insurancebylynette.com. All right, are we going, what are we going with? Uh, I'll, I'll throw this to you, Brady, uh, before your camera uh, craps out on you again. Um, no, we're good. We're good. Uh, uh, we're, uh, we're good. We have enough. We have enough. We have we enough know. camera time here. I don't know if I paid for the stream yard uh, to, to go past 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> let, let's, is it, is it a Tyler floater? I feel like that was, uh, the Highsmith's three was big. There were, I mean, we can go with a negative play of the night, like uh, not just that disaster at the end of regulation, but what exactly was Jimmy doing at the end of the first overtime? Like, what was what was that? I think the one is the Jovic three in the first overtime because okay. they, were down, they were down four at that point. I think it was around like a minute and a half to go, a minute and a half to two minutes to go. They're down four. The offense is, is non-existent. Uh, and they just swing it to, to Jovic quickly in that deep corner, and he just shoots it. Like, he just took it quick. And that's what I mean about the confidence late in the game. Like, being in this position and taking those shots and noticing that, it, you know, the game isn't swinging in one direction, that it's like it's not like somebody has a flow and being able to notice that, not only hitting it, turning around and talking to the Hawks bench. <laughs> like, that's that's what took it over, the fact of being the play of the night. Uh, I don't know. I just thought that. And then you mentioned the Haywood three. After that is when uh, – Jovic grabs the rebound, pushes it, and it's an early clock three from Awood oh, because Jovic is kind of getting in that range, went behind the back and kicked it. Like, uh, I don't know. But that that overtime stretch, like, yeah, the Tyler floater mattered. But, like, we're not seeing that Tyler floater unless Jovic does what he did in the first overtime. 
Well, I, I like this. I'm just going to take this for the comments. Our friend Donut Dan, who's on uh, on playback with us nightly. Ethan, the water cleaned up a Florida disaster of the night play. New sponsor segment. I'll reach out to to Michael Robert and all them. I think maybe we'll propose that one. Um, yeah, I, I could go. I, I could go with you on that. I think there were a few of them. Again, uh, there were some positive and some negative in this game. I I want to pivot here uh, to Bam, Alex, because. He just wasn't very good tonight, right? Like, is, is that is, 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 no? I'm just saying he wasn't very good tonight. Like, is it fair to say that? Like, yeah, absolutely fair to say. It's, that. it's like, just, just think, an off night, or was there something deeper here? You think? I don't know. I think he just didn't have a good offensive night. I think defensively, he pretty much did his job. You know, they made it hard on Dejounte, and he's obviously the anchor to that. And uh, on, of course, for, as well as their perimeter defenders, like I think he does what he does on defense uh on offense like you know the threes are cool right again like him taking them and taking a couple every game and that's fine you 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 take that happily if it's not going to change the shape of your offense it's not going to make teams all of a sudden you know like uh be staple to him but you know what if it makes him second guess that's fine i, I like it i think it helps um with their spacing as it is but honestly outside of the, the three-point shooting like there wasn't much to be happy about with him on the offensive side of the floor like they need they're obviously going to need more from him uh, as the playoffs approach. But, hey, you got through the night. He, you know, Jimmy, Tyler, and Jovich were the linchpins of your offense. Bam was the linchpins of your defense. And I feel like that's kind of the blueprint we saw tonight. Uh, l- let's let's touch on Jimmy here. Uh, getting a comment, a couple comments in here that we never have anything nice to say about Jimmy. It's a, I, I don't think that's been the case over the past uh, five seasons. Um, but I, I think there's been some frustration with the the energy level at times and and the consistency level and then the end of the game stuff um so so brady let, let's let's get to the end of the game stuff tonight with him uh, because again he he made some plays that mattered and uh he's kind of doing the Dwayne thing now which he never used to do which is arguing with the officials and not getting back on defense he did that twice today and actually it seems to work for him because he gets a call on the next play. It happened in the Indiana game too, where it's like he didn't get a call on something he should have gotten a call on. And then he just flipped it up on the next possession and they gave him a makeup call. Um, he did has had double digit free throws as Alex mentioned the past two games. So that's good, but it also seems like he's not getting as many as he should get based on the way that the officials used to call it. So Let's go through that a little bit. Uh, how he handles the officiating now, because it seems to be in his head at this stage, and then, you know, the late game stuff and some of the decision making. Yeah, well, I feel like the Heat are very aware of the free throw thing because the way they started this game, like I felt like they made a total adjustment that they were like, okay, we want to try to get Jimmy in positions to get to the line or in positions to score in the paint, where they basically started the game and they just ran a bunch of high low stuff for him. Like they just basically kept hitting him over the top and trying to get him in that range. Then they started using it as a roller. Like we saw a couple of Jovic, uh, Jimmy pick and rolls. We saw things of that nature where they were just trying to find any way to get him uh, going toward the basket in that short roll or anything like that. And he had like five free throws in, the, in that first stint where it seemed like he was getting to those spots. He had another one where he just sent a, uh, a shoulder to Garrison Matthews and then got an and one into it. And it was like, okay, you can still kind of get those calls here and there. The thing that surprises me is – the mid-range stuff. We keep talking about it, but like the, that's the thing that surprised me is that we're not seeing as much of that from him. That it's like it's the first level. It's either I'm going to get all the way in, I'm going to get to the line, or I'm going to get a layup. Or if not, I'll just settle with a three, the occasional three from beyond the arc. Anything in between there, he's not really getting to a ton. Um, and I think that will kind of be the adjustment in the playoffs as teams continue to try to make him to take those shots. But as far as the end of uh, end of game stuff, I mean, we know what it is. It's never going to change. Like as much as we say you're talking about, you think. This is year five. They're not going to change him now of taking those right wing threes. It just is what it is. Like there was a point where I was like, before that that final regulation shot, I was like, okay, this is a position they've been trying to hunt mismatches for him. They kept he kept looking for the Garrison Matthews matchup, like over and over and over. All of a sudden, on that final possession, it's Caleb screening for him, who wasn't even guarded by Matthews. He was guarded by, by Bogdanovich. Uh, and actually, on that play, Garrison Matthews was being guarded by Jovic. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity. Say if you're going to clear out, put Jovic as the screener. And if anything, he's the valve that if things go wrong, you hit Jovic and he can either, you know, create and kick to somebody else or make a play there. It just seemed like that was the way to go. And and they ended up hitting a wall, as we know. So it's, I think the big thing at the end of play stuff, 
is not even probably who has the ball in their hands. It's about the others that don't have the ball in their hands. That's kind of mm-hmm. the bigger deal. I mean, look at every mm-hmm. scenario that they've had, you know, in recent memory of them with a final play. It's three guys just standing around looking at the ball. They're just watching the play as we mm-hmm. are. Like, they're, they're just sitting there watching it. It's like, that's not a heat offense. That's not a normal possession that they run. They're running kind of guys all over the place, screening down, trying to pull defenders, weak, weak side help defenders. They just go away from it on final possessions. They just It's always what they do. And I just feel like they have to play their mm-hmm. game in that final spot. They have to. And I remember, you know, Recent playoff games, like think about like the, the Milwaukee game five, the, the play that they drew up there. Like, yeah, it was a crazy Jimmy shot over the top. But like they've had movement in those spots. It's legitimately mm-hmm. like – and people joke about it. But it's legitimately like they save everything for the playoffs. <laughs> like it really feels like that because yeah. we don't see a lot of the other stuff about of these stupid possessions of guys looking around at that time. And I don't know. It just feels like they need to start gearing up for that because Spo talked all last year about like, okay, these clutch games are helpful. They, we, we need these. They, this is going to prepare us for the playoffs. Well – they haven't had a lot of successful ones at, at this point this season. So, like, they need to still still kind of get those going before the play-in. You know, uh, something you said there uh, strikes me. Um, when you said it's never going to change, okay? And it reminds me of a conversation I had with Spo uh, late in in Dwayne's run, uh, after, uh, b- before he left, okay, before he left and came back. Uh, he had missed a bunch of these late-game shots. Like, Dwayne was not efficient, <laughs> in clutch situations uh, towards the end of, again, his first tenure with the Heat. I mean, there was a game, probably Heat fans in the chat will remember this one. There was a game against Charlotte. He just took this ridiculous 22-foot shot and all the rest of this. And and I said to Spo, I said, is is there anything you can do about this? And he looked me in the eye and he says, I will go to my grave with Dwayne Wade taking the shot at the end of the game. And then he started saying that to everybody. But I feel like that's where he's at with Jimmy. Like I, it's it's just like like he fans want this to change. He is not Spo for all the talk about analytics and sets and all this. Spo Spo is about people. Okay, it's ultimately why he's become such a successful coach. All right, he's about people. He trusts Jimmy. That's it. But, he's going to continue to trust people- Jimmy. I don't think people don't trust Jimmy. I think it's the shots that Jimmy's taking. Like, I think everybody would be fine if he lived yeah. and died by Jimmy. If Jimmy was taking Jimmy shots, like if it was Jimmy in the mm-hmm. lane, Jimmy trying to, you know, take contact, go for a little push shot or things of that nature. But it's the fact that it's Jimmy plus a wild, you know, contested three every time. I, I, that, that's true. Don't you think that every team now on defense knows, like, that Jimmy's going to ultimately be in some kind of ISO situation or aborted pick and roll, and that and is going to end up taking most likely some contested step back at the from end the right of the game side of the floor. This one, from the right side of the line. This one he just threw the grenade to Tyler, right? That but was like, awful, by the way. <laughs> but it's just like, like I, I mean, I got to think like. Spo is smart enough to understand. It's kind of what we talk about their transition offense or, or sort of the working with three of them. He's smart enough to understand. He knows. He knows. He knows that he's, they're being scouted this way, and yet he's going to go to it anyway because, as I said, he's always going to go on the side of the person that he trusts. I'm with you, Brady. There are other ways to involve him in some of those sets. What did Alex's cavern this we're like the Haw- we're like the Heat against the Hawks tonight. We better win this game at the end. How do you um, have the best technology? That- it's amazing. I mean, when you're, when, when, I mean, I mean, when you're Generation X, you can solve anything. That's how this works. Alex is back with a camera. All right. Um, I, I just, I, I think we need to do a full podcast on this, okay? And and how they sort out the end of game stuff because now Terry's going to come back. In fact, you know what? Let's go to the injury report. And now it's time for the official five on the floor injury report sponsored by our friend Eric Rubenstein, the personal injury attorney born and raised in Lauderdale, Florida, lives in Miami, went to St. Thomas. He's a South Florida guy and a huge Miami Heat fan. But the important thing is he can help you get your money that you deserve when something happens to you. So reach out to our guy, Eric Rubenstein. Again, ericrubenstein.com or ask about me. I got you on Instagram. And now the injury report. I forgot to mute when I cough, so I'm on the injury report also. Um, I think one of these two guys is going to be back soon and the other isn't. That, that's what this looks like to me. Uh, Terry Rozier uh, woke up with a stiff neck. 
probably shouldn't have played against Indiana, did play, uh, did not play tonight. I wouldn't be surprised if he plays tomorrow, and that will help considering the number of minutes that these other guys have played. I wouldn't be surprised if one of them sits, to be honest. And then you have Rozier trying to carry the offense a little bit. Um, the Duncan Robinson situation is not promising. I because like, when we talked to Duncan, first thing we talked this facet syndrome. Uh, again, people smarter than me in the medical field will understand exactly what that is. Um, basically, it's a back injury. He told us, I read myself and Barry, he's never had a back injury before. Didn't really know how it was going to respond. He ends up. Uh, not coming back right away. We thought he might be back a little sooner. He comes back, and now he's acknowledged that he actually rushed it to come back. And it's it's interesting because all year, Heat fans and us, we've complained about guys taking too long to come back and sitting for this minor thing or that minor thing. And now you've got a player who basically, heroes come back, looks like he took the right amount of time because he's come back uh, playing physically and and uh, you know and by that I mean he's been physical and the way he's played and he looks healthy uh, and spry and he played 48 minutes tonight. Uh, Duncan did not look right, and now we're in the opposite situation where maybe a guy came back too soon. This is problematic, <laughs> uh, you know, because honestly Duncan Robinson was holding this thing together for long parts of the season. Uh, we can't diminish this. Um, so we'll devote an entire podcast to this probably on Thursday. I don't want to go too deep into this in the 36 minute of this thing, but it, it's problematic because a lot of what they do offensively is unlocked by Duncan Robinson, especially this season, and it didn't happen. But, Alex, I'll let you jump in on it. Um, I just honestly, what I wanted to talk about was just some interesting stats that I saw from the game tonight. Nothing to do with the injury report. Shout out, Eric. Uh, all right. Uh, shout out Eric Rubenstein. We'll go to ericrubenstein.com. Uh, before we do, we we'll do want to mention on the good and bad side, and then we'll close this thing out with some of the stats uh, and get out of here. Um, Kevin Love played only six minutes. That was surprising. So we'll see. I mean, Kevin had, came back playing really well uh, and then has tailed off a little bit. Didn't play a lot of last late. Either. No, he did not. Uh, Haywood Highsmith played 35 minutes. Uh, did some remarkably silly things late in the game, but then made a clutch three. Um, usually he's reliable with these kind of this kind of stuff, and I, I don't know what was going on. And then he was he was way short on a couple of jumpers. He did play 35 minutes and ended up with 13, 7, and 2, and he did make three three-pointers. Uh, we mentioned Hawkes had the one three and, and really nothing else. And then, uh, and we'll get to this comment from David here in a second. And then DeLon Wright, though, he was kind of an X factor tonight. 21 minutes, three or four from the field, seven points, and the defense that we know he brings. Um, and maybe he features into this a little bit more if Duncan's going to be out for a while. So we'll see. Again, he plays a different way. This comes in from, I cannot pronounce your last name. I apologize. I'm terrible at this. I couldn't pronounce, like, you know. Jeff Smith. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to be But our friend David here in the chat. Facet syndrome sucks, hard to treat, pain can be intense, more concerned about his long-term future than this season. It's not great. It's not great. So we'll we'll see. Um, and it's unfortunate because the man was I having called a back to the last episode. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, I called him the most reliable player on the team this year, and then he, he went out with a back injury in the next game. So I apologize for that. Uh Thanks Alex, so you've got Alex, you've got some stats. I mean, honestly, I'm just demoralized after that, but um, there's some interesting stats from tonight. First and foremost, like I had to double take and, and check different sources to make sure this was correct. The Heat, you know, took 88 field goal attempts tonight. The Hawks, 113. And a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of that came from the 17 to 5 offensive rebound deficit between the Hawks and the Heat. It's something we've definitely seen before, specifically that playing game versus the Hawks last year. Um, and you know, that was just something that, you know, stood off the page to me. The Heat, you know, finished with seven more free throw attempts than the Hawks, but only made only with four more made free throws. So, you know, they helped make, make up for it with some of that. The other thing, the Heat made their jumpers tonight, you know, hit 40% from three, 50% in the mid range, didn't finish well at the rim, which is something that is consistent for the Heat, you know, throughout their inconsistent, they don't, I mean, throughout their inconsistent mm -hmm. season, they consistently do not finish well at the rim. So there's that. Um, but you did keep the Hawks to 22% from three, and you held them to a third percentile half-court offensive rating. And that is kind of the theme we've seen with this team since the you know second half of the season. 
uh, is that their defense has been much better. And look, 64th percentile half court offensive rating yeah. for the that's kind of been like you know about to the best that we can get from them is around a 60th percentile offense and then you know it's an elite to sub elite defense and then the the one thing that really i think could have made this game quicker for and you know quicker for all of us is if the he didn't commit 18 turnovers and you know the hawks kind of beat you at your own game when it comes to points off turnovers and all that and yeah that's about it <laughs> We want to thank Alex at the end of the day for trying to throw statistical lipstick on this pig. Uh, the Heat win one seventeen to one. There were sixty four percent in the half court offense tonight. That sixty four percentile that surprises me. Actually, you know what? We we know we got a lot of fans in the chat here that that run their businesses. We need we need a sponsor for Alex's end of right for like for, for the end, end of podcast stat segments. We need a sponsor, so somebody step up. Uh, Alex, myself, and Brady, the three that you see here, uh, we will be at the game tomorrow night. Not sure which Heat players will actually be playing, but we'll be there for Dallas and Miami. And then Greg, most likely, will be hosting the podcast after, or the stream after the game. Have a good one, everybody. It's good. <laughs> oh, off the floor. Yeah. Subscribe. <laughs> Let's